Probably the biggest mistake that the Biden administration has done is first off between either Trump and um, and we haven't even talked about the former president, but between the former president and COVID or now with Ukraine and COVID, 80 percent, 75 percent of the media oxygen is gone out of every day. So the bandwidth that you used to be there for a White House to go out and build proactive policy driven messaging is essentially gone. You take a half hour news program and 18, 19, 20 minutes of that is a, is already gone. It's already booked. Good evening. I'm Susan Spurlock, Executive Director of Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's program, Midterm Pulse Check, Can Biden's Party Beat the Odds? The final program in our six-week spring seminar series, Governing in Crisis, Biden and the Looming Midterms. There is widespread expectation that the Democrats will suffer losses in the 2022 midterms at all levels. The political environment is challenging with pain at the gas pump, inflation stretching paychecks, pandemic fatigue, and disappointment with what Biden has been able to deliver. The war in Ukraine and bitter partisan divides divides over hot button issues. Will Biden's performance amidst all this bad news be rewarded or punished at the polls? In this evening's program, our moderator, Stephanie Murray, author of Politico's daily campaign newsletter, Morning Score, and our panel of experts will explore the state of the state and the race as we approach midterms. The series is presented by Suffolk University Political Science and Legal Studies Department in collaboration with Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University, the Washington Center and GBH Forum Network. I'd also like to recognize the Lowell Institute whose generous funding makes programs like this possible. It's now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Christina Coolidge, a faculty member in Suffolk University's Political Science and Legal Studies Department. Christina? Thank you, Susan. And thank you to everyone who is here today, our panelists, our students, and the general audience. This is going to bring to a close our six episode series on looking into the Biden administration what he's been able to accomplish, what he hasn't been able to accomplish, and what that means for the upcoming midterms. Now, of course, no one is going to cast a vote for Biden, but midterms are also all about President Biden. So tonight, we really want our panel of experts to do what political scientists don't really do, and that is predict the future, dust off your crystal balls, and give us your best guesstimate about what's going to happen. Of course, we know that the party of the president in his first term, because we've never had a woman as president, tend to lose ground in Congress and elsewhere. It's only happened twice in contemporary times that presidents have beat this. And the question really is, given all that's working against the Democrats, are they going to be able to avoid the kind of shellacking that President Obama had in his first term? So without any further ado, I'd like to give a quick introduction to our panelists, and then we'll throw to Stephanie. We have Julia Zari, who is a presidential scholar and a professor at Marquette University, Uh, Roger Fisk, who is the founder of New Day Strategies. He's also an alumnus of John Kerry's Senate career, his presidential campaign, and also an alumnus of both Obama administrations. But more importantly, he's also a Suffolk alum. So I'll just 
throw that out there. We also have Dave pa Paleologus, who is our resident pollster. He runs national polls out of Suffolk University, and hopefully he's going to give you some teasers about stuff that we don't know that he's doing. And finally, Stephanie Murray from Politico, who I found out from one of my students does have more in common with us than being in from Massachusetts. She also interned at the State House, which is something that like three quarters of our students do. So Stephanie, take it away. Hello. Um, thank you so much for hosting us tonight. I'm really excited to talk with our panelists. Um, I just want to say a quick thank you to Suffolk University, the Ford Hall Forum, the Washington Center, and GBH Forum Network for putting this on tonight. Um, and our conversation, just to frame it a little bit, is all about the midterms. We are headed toward an historic election cycle this fall. Uh, the November election is only 202 days away. Uh, we've already had our first midterm primaries in Texas last month, and the next ones in Ohio and Indiana are coming up in less than two weeks. And, you know, our central question tonight is whether President Joe Biden's party can beat the odds. Uh, all signs are pointing toward uh, a shellacking, as you said, for Democrats this fall. Um, and so I'd love to just get into it a little bit more. To start off, we're going to go to some opening statements from our panelists and the order will go Julia, Roger, and then David. So Julia, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that, that introduction, Christina. Um, I'm really glad to be here. I want to talk about a couple of possibilities for um, the kind of breaking of the midterm curse. The first one is to talk about those two instances that Christina talked about in modern times in which the president's party has actually been able to gain seats um, and what features might unify the, those moments. So the first one is 1998, um, Bill Clinton, second term president, Democrat, in the midst of an impeachment and yet very popular. Um, and that was that was a midterm election in which the, the Republicans actually lost seats, um, didn't lose control of Congress, but lost seats. The second is 2002, um, just the next midterm after that, George W. Bush's first term and a midterm very much informed by the September 11th, 2001 terrorist attacks. So I think that what draws these two elections together is the, the potential for one party to, for the party in power, the president's party to kind of define the terms of the debate and for the opposition party to really lose control of those terms. Um, I, I think, you know, in 98, the Republicans got pinned with an unpopular impeachment at a time when the economy was also very strong and have a lot to run on. Um, in 2002, Republicans really were able to effectively control the narrative about their response to the 9-11 attacks, and the Democrats didn't have a lot to respond with. Um, I don't really see these dynamics in play in 2022. I think I, what we're seeing instead is something really different in which maybe neither party really has full command of the political narrative. And as as, as Christina mentioned earlier, we, we're in a kind of situation where there's just multiple crises and that Biden now kind of owns these crises. Yet at the same time, it's not totally clear to me that Republicans have taken control of the narrative for each of these um, for each of these crises. So there's time, I think, for either party to make a more compelling national pitch. Um, and that's where the second idea that I want to talk about comes in. I just want to very briefly talk about the dynamics of the 2020 election, because as um, as, as Christina posed it really well, her early remarks about Biden that were sort of, you know, will Biden get punished or rewarded for the state of the situation? Well, two years ago, that question was being posed about Donald Trump. Um, and the answer is that as a presidency scholar, and as someone who has looked at the way that the, the fundamental conditions of the country predict the president's party's share of the popular vote, I would have expected, and many of us expected, for Trump to win fewer votes. The, all of those numbers predicted that Trump should have lost by more, and he didn't. And what's, what's going on there is that polarization really has changed the way that political conditions shape voting decisions. And so one of the big questions going forward for the Democratic Party is whether they also can kind of ignite those dynamics, activate their base, get 
turnout that resembles what they had in 2018 or 2020. Um, and whether Democrats, even if they're not super happy with everything that Biden has done, or they wish he had done more, or, you know, everyone is sick of, of the pandemic and inflation, and, you know, those are very unpopular <laughs> with everyone, whether they nevertheless um, come out and cast a vote for their party, just as Republicans displayed that kind of party loyalty um, in November 2020. Thanks. Uh, Roger, we'll kick it over to you. Thank you, um, Stephanie. Thank you, Fort Hall Forum. Thank you, Suffolk University. I'm a two-time alum, not to, not to um, fact check Christina that early in our program here this evening. And then as a, as a Massachusetts kid, to, to be on any kind of program that has anything to do with WGBH is a, is a, is a big deal. Um, I think given the incandescence of our moderator and the rest of the panel, my, my role is to represent kind of the meaty kind of bottom part of the curve here tonight, um, because I'm essentially kind of a simple uh, practitioner. Um, but that said, you know, we, we, we meet here this evening um, during very interesting times. Um, American politics are pendulous. And the question always is, is like kind of how far does that pendulum swing? And there's a couple things that I always look to. I think one of the most interesting guiding documents for anyone out there who hasn't read it, not to reference one of David's uh, potential competitors, but Tony Fabrizio, the former President Trump's own pollster, did a post-mortem on the 2020 presidential election, which really anatomized educated suburban women voters, uh, mainly uh, along with some other um, subsets. And I think that's really going to be kind of an interesting guiding document as we go forward, which is to look at the suburbs of Orlando and Cincinnati and Philadelphia and things like that, and get a sense of where those folks are going. Um, and then I, I'm, I'm not going to make a long introductory statement because I want to make sure we have time for the students to, to, to chime in. But, you know, uncertainty never cuts in a progressive direction. When, when people are uncertain about their family, their economic future, they don't wake up and say, wow, I'm uncertain. Like we should make sure that community college is more affordable. They wake up and they say, I'm uncertain about our economic future. So I'm going to kind of withdraw a little bit and, and kind of tighten up my decisions and be a lot more defensive in my kind of civic role and, and, and what I'm willing to spend money on and things like that. So uncertainty always kind of gets people to, to, to retreat a little bit. Um, and we'll see coming up if that translates into midterm voting behavior. Um, but I very much look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much for having me. And I'll pass it back to you, Stephanie, for our next panelist. Wonderful. Thank you. And now, David, we'll send it over to you for an opening statement. Okay, great. Thank you also to WGBH. Uh, thank you to uh, the Fort Hall Forum and also to President Kelly, to President Marissa Kelly. Um, you know, she's been terrific in terms of being a supporter of the Research Center. Um, and uh, we we're really grateful for, for her support. I wanted to um, to talk a little bit about some recent polling, but I first wanted to start off with the last slide. Can we all see that okay? All right, so I wanted to start with the last um, the last slide from my January presentation. And uh, for us, this was this is interesting because it kind of talks about the issues when I was asked from the from the January presentation, what kinds of issues are impacting the midterms? There were numerous issues. COVID, obviously, the economy. At the time, we really weren't sure where inflation or the Fed rate hikes were going to be. Um, we, um, you know, uh, uh, Build Back Better was an issue, but I think that's kind of gone away. It's kind of dissipated in terms of what people are talking about. The January 6th investigation, CRT in classrooms, which keeps bubbling up. The issue will go away this spring and summer when folks are out of school but then will resurface a la Virginia and New Jersey potentially in the fall. The international crisis, now when I made this slide in January and the internet, there was no international crisis. I was thinking more of uh, someplace else in the world. I had no idea that you know we'd be talking about Ukraine here, but that certainly is an issue that normally helps an incumbent president 
Uh, we were talking about President Bush and how the the uh, September 11th issue actually improved what happened in the midterms under his presidency. We haven't seen that here yet. The health of President Biden, um, far left and right within parties, we'll get into primaries in a bit. The U.S. mental health crisis, which was a big issue, I think that's going to be uh, nil in terms of between now and the November elections and voting rights. But I particularly wanted to talk about the most recent Nevada poll. Nevada is an interesting state. It's a state with both U.S. senators who are Democrat, a governor who is Democrat, and three out of four Congress per, per, uh, people who are Democrats. This is a question that we asked. Uh, which uh, we wanted to identify among likely voters in Nevada, um, which of these three statements came closest to their view. Almost a majority said that they wanted their vote in November to change the direction President Biden is leading the nation. Only 27 percent. Now, this is vir this is virtually a, 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 a novel Democratic state of recent times. Only 27 percent of likely midterm voters said, I want my vote in November to support the direction President Biden is leading the nation and the rest uh, saying it doesn't matter. My vote doesn't matter. It's not connected. We asked the question of right track, wrong track. And I wanted to go back four years ago to the Nevada poll, two Nevada polls that we did in 2018. You can see right track, we exceeded wrong track in both the July 2018 poll, 46 right track, 35 wrong track, and the September poll, 56 right track, 27 wrong track. But you see here in the April 2022 poll, more people, 50% are saying wrong track, only 40% right track. When we asked the same question from four years ago about the standard of living today, July and September, you see people are saying that their standard of living is better almost by two to one. But here it's two to one against uh, uh, being better. It's two, two to one saying that their standard of living is worse. This is why I don't think we can necessarily blame directly President Biden. You've got a very bleak outlook on the economy. And speaking of the economy, we asked the question about economic conditions in Nevada. July and September, you have the green and blue bars were excellent and good. You can see the combined green and blue bars in July were 61% in September, was 62%, but here in April, the combined is only 25%. And you can see a super majority of people in Nevada right now say that economic conditions in Nevada are fair or poor. Those are dire conditions for any Democrat. And so in the gubernatorial ballot tests, you have the blue line is Governor Sisolak against five potential opponents. We don't know who they are because they haven't had their primary yet. But in each scenario, you can see that Governor Sisolak is at or below 41%, which is a very difficult place to be for any incumbent. Now he leads in two of the five, in two of the five he trails all within the margin of error. Um, and then he is exactly tied uh, with one of his challenges, Heller, uh, on the Republican side. For Senate, uh, same kind of bleak news. You've got incumbent Senator uh, uh, Cortez Masto at 40 percent. Laxalt, one of the Republicans, is at 43. Again, it's within the margin of error, but the incumbent is only polling at 40 percent against Brown, uh, who is a newcomer and is challenging Laxalt for the Republican nomination. La, the, Brown is leading the incumbent Cortez Masto 40 to 39. So I kind of wanted to look at the race breakdowns to see if there were any interesting sort of nuggets in the poll. And among whites, as is the case in most polls uh, and in most exit polls, um, whites are tend to break Republican, and this was no different. 55% for the Republican Laxalt, 31% of whites for Cortez Masto. However, Cortez Masto won among Blacks, 61-14, and among Hispanics, 57 to 27. And so looking at this, I was sort of figuring out, well, what is the voter intensity? Because if the voter intensity, that is the willingness to get out and vote, is higher among Blacks and Hispanics and lower among whites, then Cortez Masto has a shot um, at potentially closing the margin and prevailing, as most Democrats do in Nevada. But what we found is the 
opposite. So if you look at the breakdown of whites versus blacks and Hispanics, and only look at the people who said they were extremely or very interested in the election, it's the opposite. 82% of whites are extremely or very interested in voting in the US Senate race right now. Only 68% of blacks said the same and only 75% of Hispanics uh, said the same. So these are the challenges that, that lie ahead in terms of the race breakdown and race, uh, Hispanics make up 20% plus of Nevada likely voters. Um, but these are the challenges ahead in terms of the intensity of voters who are coming out um, with the backdrop of a bad economy in Nevada, bad economic conditions, and how this one particular seat, which really didn't get a lot of national play this poll, it got a ton of play by the Reno Gazette Journal, which is our media partner out there. Um, and I think the, the, the sort of the reverberations of this poll um, have made their way through sort of think tanks in the academic community. And I just wanted to leave viewers with a little teaser, as Christina mentioned, about upcoming polls. We are polling twice in releasing in early May, both a national uh, voter poll uh, of, of, of voters measuring President Biden's approval, right track, uh, wrong track, congressional generic ballot, midterm voter intensity, the U Ukraine-Russia war, and other issues. We're doing that with USA Today. And we're also planning to poll um, some issues more about COVID. Uh, we're polling Massachusetts residents, not necessarily voters, although there will be voters as a subset of this, on the topics of state leadership, the race for governor, COVID, um, uh, death with uh, dignity, questions on the Massachusetts economy, and pending legislation before the state legislature. And I'll wrap it up uh, there. And uh, uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, but my first question here goes to Julia. And it's a three pronged question. Um, what is President Joe Biden's mandate? Um, as Christina mentioned earlier, uh, Biden is not on the ballot this fall, but it seems like he and the Democrats will kind of get punished for his approval rating in the direction of the country. So one, what is his mandate? Um, mm -hmm. Two, do Republicans have control of the narrative around all of these uh, challenges in the country that David mentioned, the economy, the direction of the country, um, all of those conditions? And three, can Democrats reclaim it um, in the next 202 days? And what would that look like? Yeah, so great set of questions. I want to start with the, the mandate question. Um, I, just by way of background, I wrote a book about presidential mandates that came out in 2014, two years before the most interesting case occurred um, of the interpretation of the 2016 election. Um, and, and, you know, interpreting 2020 is a whole other thing. Um, I think that a lot of the period in which Biden would have spent kind of constructing a story about what the election meant and kind of one thing that presidents and their teams tend to do is sort of throw out a bunch of different stories. Democrats in particular will throw out a lot of different issue interpretations. Um, and if they're smart, they'll sort of see what sticks. Um, and a lot of that time was eaten up by um, by the former president's challenges against the election result. And so that really shaped, um, I think, some of the context. Of course, the, the pressing nature of the pandemic at that sort of early vaccine time also shaped that. Um, and so I think there's kind of a tension there. I think that there are people who cast their ballots for Biden expecting um, some movement on some very particular agenda items in, in the economy, in um, the issue of student debt, on the environment, there were a lot of issue differences. And I think Biden, if you were looking closely, did present himself as a fairly substantive candidate. And a lot of kind of commentators on the, on the left in particular have written about that. But on the other hand, the other story was really about Biden not being Trump and capitalizing on some of the ways in which Trump was unpopular even before COVID hit and ways in which the public was responding to his, um, his reaction to the, to the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's a difficult position, I think, for a president to be in, to have kind of run on this mostly negative and repudiative kind of platform, this rejection idea. And then you kind of get into office and it's like, well, you've built this really big, complicated coalition of everybody from John Kasich to AOC. Now what? Um, I think that I think that the Democratic Party is always a little like that. 
it's a very patchwork party that draws from a lot of different pockets of society. Um, and coordinating is very difficult. And you add to that razor thin margins in the Senate, no margin in the Senate, very thin margins in the House, um, and a, a huge number of problems. And you have a really um, difficult political environment in which to identify solid promises and then um, and then deliver on them. Yeah, so I think that I've been kind of playing with this idea for a couple of years. And so I, as in, in um, so doing, I've alienated basically everyone I know, um, arguing about what's, you know, kind of how both parties are facing challenges, establishing a kind of clear governing idea, a clear policy platform, selling that to a majority of voters, and then holding that majority coalition together long enough to govern. Um, I think both parties have different challenges with that. But essentially what I think has was the case prior to 2020 is that um, Democrats had some advantages on the issues in terms of public support. Narrow advantages, but advantages. Um, that has potentially, I mean, this is where, you know, David is the pollster um, and, and Roger is a sort of deep political insider. So I, they may have better detailed knowledge than I. But it seems to me that that's evaporated some, somewhat over the year, uh, over the course of the year. Um, and that Democrats have sort of lost that, that identification edge and maybe even lost some of that public confidence in their ability to handle issues like the economy. Um, I think that we're also in a very odd moment in the economy for Democrats to kind of define. We're, we're sort of accustomed to the idea of a recession and low, um, low employment levels. Um, inflation, you know, it's, it's odd to have people complaining about the economy at a time when there are a lot of jobs, but inflation is, is very real and people really feel that. Um, and so in some ways, I think for Republicans, it's fairly easy to define that as Joe Biden has made your life worse. Um, it's much more challenging for the opposition party to say, here's what we're going to do about it. And that's especially difficult, I think, for, um, for Republicans who are at a, a fairly, I think, many years deep disadvantage in terms of when voters hear about some of their economic policies, they may not be um, sympathetic to all of them. And they, they tend, if you strip away the party labels, to be um, more sort of center left. Um, so to answer your final question, can Democrats regain that, that narrative? I think Democrats are at a real disadvantage and we were invited to promote our own work. So I'm going to just, I forgot to send a link, but I wrote a piece in the New York Times um, that came out at the end of December of 2021 about the Democratic Party. And one of the things I wanted to challenge was this idea that oh, Democrats are just bad at politics, just flailing around. Um, I don't think that's it. It's that they have a very complicated coalition and there's not really a clear, simple message that's going to draw together all the different pieces of the Democratic coalition. And that's one of the reasons why messaging is really um, is really challenging. So it's not totally obvious to me that they have a sort of narrative advantage, but it's also not obvious to me that Republicans will be able to, to permanently create one either. So I think we're really, we're really in a tough spot. Both parties are a little, a little stagnant um, and a little bit challenged in terms of, of doing that whole process, like I said, of building a national majority and then carrying that, that majority into a kind of sustained political and policy agenda. Thank you. Um, and this next question is for David, and it comes from the audience. And uh, the question is, you know, in Politico playbook recently, uh, John Anslone, who's President Biden's pollster, said that this is the worst political environment he's ever seen for the president's party. Um, are things really that bad? You know, if you look at the Nevada poll results and our national poll results, they're, they're, they're pretty bad. I mean, I don't know what Anslone's time references. I mean, I lived through stagflation in the 1970s. Yes, I'm that old. And uh, the 87 stock market crash and a bunch of other things. And, and things were pretty bad, uh, obviously, 2001. Um, you know, it's it's challenging. The, the, the problem, and, and it's unfortunate because the the problem for President Biden is that, and and what what's ironic is he'll go down in history, at least in you know for, for quite some time as the president who got the most votes ever more than barack obama more than anyone um and yet he's probably the most least connected to voters people voted for biden because he was the alternative to donald trump 
but people didn't have an emotional connection to him. Part of it was his age. Part of it was because he was moderate and people couldn't really uh, get their arms around the fact that he was a calm alternative to Donald Trump. And so it's a great place to be if you're the alternative and you win and he won. And then his favorables and his job performance ratings were above 50 for many months until Afghanistan, the Afghanistan pullout. But the problem is, is when things get bad and you don't have a direct connection to a president, you, you, you see a downward spiral, a downward spiral lower than I've seen in a long time. Not only low 40s approval, but now high 30s, mid 30s. It was 35 in the Nevada poll. Unlike President uh, Clinton, unlike President Barack Obama, who had passion, who had positive energy, who had a following, Biden doesn't have that. And so now he's left picking up the pieces, uh, as previously discussed, with a party of multiple coalitions trying to tie it all in, together and weave it all together into sort of a quilt that will be acceptable, not only to Democrats, but independents. Interesting. Thank you to Sarah Burnham for that question, by the way. And this next one goes to Roger, also from the audience. Uh, and it's given your experience, do you think it is appropriate for Democrats to be punching left in right of their dropping approval ratings? Punching left and right or punching? Uh, punching left in light of their- In, in light, got it. Yeah. Um, and by punching left, I assume that means marginalizing the progressives. Is Am I interpreting that right? Is that a fair interpretation of that question? Um, I think I would say so. That's uh, that's exactly okay. how it was worded. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll all, right, all right. Um, it's 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 very interesting um, when you look at like an Abigail Spamberger seat in suburban uh, northern Virginia. Um, she feels in a very acute, very tactile daily way what um, some of the chatter about defund the police and things like that um, can mean. The, the Republicans have done a very good job of elevating things like defund the police and, and completing uh, building CRT out of almost in, uh, whole cloth in terms of the idea that there's critical race theory that's uh, anywhere within 100 miles of elementary schools and things like that. And what I think Speaker Pelosi needs to do is recreate the um, model that she had in 2018, which is really decentralizing the races and really giving the room to and potentially even setting up votes specifically for some of those um, 40 or 50 swing seats to, to buck leadership and create some separation. When you look back um, to the Reagan uh, tax cuts to George W. Bush, uh, President George W. Bush and the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, President Clinton and deficit reduction steps, um, President Bush and the tax cuts, President Obama and Obamacare, almost all of those things, those signature domestic achievements, um, which by definition are legislative, happened in the first 18 months or so. Um, and then and then you get to that point where where those those moderates in your own party need the room to run specifically and vote specifically for their district. So I think that, you know, the art of politics always comes down to um, balancing uh, the aspirations of some of your more progressive and your more conservative wings and then to David's point, to the, the president's challenge is to weave that into some kind of cohesive uh, uh, narrative. Um, another thing that's interesting looking forward, because just as soon as one cloud seems dark, we have to remember that even that cloud still has some silver lining. And we I just talked about a little bit of history of the last couple of administrations. In a lot of ways, it was the overreach of the contract with America in 1994 that paved the way for President Clinton's reelection in 1996. And a lot of, and also in a lot of ways, it was the febrile nature of the Tea Party in 2010 that allowed President Obama to position himself as the sober steward of America's future in 2012. So we have to always remember that sometimes this, uh, this kind of heated um, chest thumping that we're hearing now from uh, the Kevin McCarthy's and the Jim Jordans of the world, while providing a little bit of caffeine and, and possibly giving them the House majority in the short term, 
could very well ipso facto be putting in place the perfect landscape for the re-election of the president. Thanks, Roger. Um, your comment about moderates piqued, uh, reminded me, I wrote recently about how um, of the Blue Dog Coalition in Congress, which is moderate lawmakers, almost all of them are either uh, they have a primary challenger, uh, they're running for another office, or they're just retiring. Uh, Julie, I see you have your hand raised. I just wanted to briefly point out, I mentioned, mentioned this in my earlier remarks, but the difference between now and 2010 seems to me that the Democrats don't have nearly as much what we would call seat exposure, right? They're, they have in 2010, the Democrats held a bunch of seats in districts they kind of didn't have any business holding. Um, and that's maybe somewhat the case now, but they have a much smaller House majority and a very kind of competitive Senate map for either party. So that seat picture strikes me as a not a Congress scholar, it really as really different. Yeah. And it's always important to remember, and this gets to kind of how the framers, you know, kind of constructed the different chambers with the House being more impetuous and the Senate being more restrained, that the 2010 uh, House uh, comparison um, in general, we have to remember that the Senate comparison is also very applicable when you look at, for example, President Trump not, um, endorsing J.D. Vance in Ohio. It was the it was it was the inability of the Republicans to restrain their um, culture war impulses in 2010 that um, brought them to nominate a bunch of people. The Senate was essentially in their hand, um, and then they nominated people like Sharon Angle in Nevada and people like Christine O'Donnell and I think either Delaware, probably Delaware, to fill Joe Biden's Delaware. seat. Yeah, thank you. Um, that so while the House made significant gains in the 2010 cycle, it's interesting to also look that the Senate had a lot of missed opportunities because they lurched too far right, and it's that very lurching that the Senate is kind of designed to to check in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to watch. I mean, I think that this month of May, with all of the primaries coming up, Pennsylvania, Ohio, um, all these states, it's going to really give us a fascinating look into kind of who gets nominated and the challenges that come from that. Missouri is another one. Um, but now we're going to head to our student questions. Uh, thanks so much to the students for being here. Um, and the first student questioner we'll go to is Samantha. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you to our panelists for being here tonight. My question is for Roger. Since graduating from Suffolk, you have been a part of successful campaigns throughout the years, most notably mm -hmm. um, President Obama's campaign in 2008 and 2012. Um, in the coming midterms, um, and this is a sentiment that has been repeated tonight, um, people are expecting Democrats to lose majority of both chambers in Congress. From what you've seen so far, what are Democratic Democrats getting wrong or missing in terms of strategies? Um, and are there avenues that you think are currently untapped and would be beneficial for them to take advantage of? First off, as a nine out of 10 Room Raider alum, I'm gonna suggest that you would be a great candidate for 10 out of 10. So I think you have the, the background of, of, of everyone thus far. Um, to talk about tactics for a second, I think, um, you know, one of the one of the probably the biggest mistake that the Biden administration has done is first off between either Trump and um, and we haven't even talked about the former president, but between the former president and COVID or now with Ukraine and COVID, 80 percent, 75 percent of the media oxygen is gone out of every day. So the bandwidth that you used to be there for a White House to go out and build proactive policy-driven messaging is essentially gone. You take a half hour news program and 18, 19, 20 minutes of that is, a, is already gone. It's already booked. There, there is no need for more content, right? And it would have been in that room where any White House um, in any other setting would have been looking to drive home messaging. The, the, the tactical thing that I look at, and this relates to the other question that I was asked, is they coupled the infrastructure bill with the larger kind of social spending bill so closely together that to this day, um, and David could speak to this better than me, but I'm going to imagine that 99 out of 100 Americans don't know that the Biden administration passed the largest infrastructure investment in a generation. So all that room that could have been off ramps and bridges and updated rail stations, for example, in Western Massachusetts, extensions of the Green Line, extensions of the Orange Line, 
The last thing I did with the vice president in the second uh, Obama Biden administration was a tour of ports up and down the coasts of the United States, which is not uh, which is not just a blue state issue. We think of obviously the coast as being a little bit more blue, but you're talking about Savannah, Georgia. You're talking about Miami, Florida. You're talking about uh, New Orleans and our ports right now. Um, can't even accommodate the largest freighter, the largest class of freighter that's running around the world right now. So we have aged ourselves out of giving the tools to our small businesses to export and compete because there's a whole class of freighter that can't even fit into many of our largest ports in America right now. So that that to me, uh, especially given the the the, the, the president's um, uh, connection and, and David was very good in speaking about the president's um, connection issues and challenges. When he talks about infrastructure and he talks about union jobs and he talks about paycheck kind of conversations over the kitchen table, this president is very, very good on that. And I think they denied themselves hundreds of events across the country um, where they could have been driving that home because they coupled that infrastructure bill so closely with the social spending. So if I were to pick out one thing that they did kind of tactically, that would probably be at the top of my list. Thanks, Roger and Samantha. Uh, next, we'll go to Isabel. Thank you to our panelists for being here this evening. Um, and it's wonderful to see Julia and Roger again following Suffolk's Inside Washington seminar in January. Um, but my question is specifically for you, Julia. As an American politics professor, a writer, and an outspoken political contributor to the 538 podcast, how have the past six years changed the way you teach and talk about political science? And as a political science student myself, I'm familiar with the palpable tension of po the political sphere. And so I'm curious how you feel this tension and if you felt any hesitancy in the classroom, whether that there were any changes to the classroom dynamic or hesitancy in general classroom discussion in this age of accelerated political polarization. Sorry, um, it's really not a Zoom unless someone talks while they're muted. Um, that's a really great question. I do think that the the last couple of years, so the last six years or so, have really um, kind of shaped how I think about how the American public perceives its institutions and how people kind of see politics as what its purpose is. Um, and I'll use the example of the class I'm teaching right now, because I feel like there's, you know, when I'm teaching American presidency, and I feel like when I've been teaching governance, it, it's not that my students aren't interested, because of course, I'm an extremely fascinating lecturer. Um, but it's that they, um, you know, the terminology and the ideas that we're talking about aren't ideas that are sort of floating around the way that they used to be. Um, I used to teach American presidency during the Bush administration and the Obama administration. And it was kind of like, you know, I talked about like people in the White House and the czars and the this and the cabinet. And like people kind of saw that. My students were kind of familiar with that. What changed in the last six years was it really became very focused on the spectacle and the elections. There's sort of a, a palpable familiarity with with the kinds of ideas that are associated with the days we talk about elections versus the days we talk about governance. And I don't think this is my students fault. I think this is the environment that they've grown up in. Um, that is just, you know, you can tell when you're teaching what people have heard of and what were you going to like need to dial it back. Um, and define things at a very, very basic level. And I do think that that is linked to people's, there's a, another person has posed some kind of question about faith in institutions, about sort of investment in institutions. People sense that something they can expect from government is that their problems will be solved. And I think instead people have shifted to an expectation that what they, what they can expect is that their grievances will be reflected back at them. Um, and that I think is asymmetric across the two parties. It's easier for Republicans to do that with a more um, kind of similar to itself coalition than for Democrats that are pulling from all these disparate groups. Um, you have, I'm doing really badly with remembering parts of questions today. I apologize. Um, oh, you asked about tension in the classroom. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I will say, so I was, I was uh, teaching a section of American presidency as a teaching assistant the night that George W. Bush was reelected. So this has kind of been, and that was very tense. This has kind of been my whole career. Um, it is noticeably 
angrier and maybe noticeably more ideologically polarized on my campus than it was a decade ago. Um, but also, I think, you know, I sort of teach on a campus where people often are like afraid to offend each other. Um, so I would like to see a little bit more, I don't know, um, engagement in that regard. And in some ways, I think that my students do reflect um, the growth of civic engagement. One thing I told my students in November 2020, people were like really freaked out about what was going to happen in the election. I told them when I was where you are, it was 2000 and I couldn't get my roommates to vote or convince them that there was any difference between the two candidates. I hope that all of us college students and people out in the world can harness our sort of sense of civic engagement and, and civic investment um, and turn that into something, um, you know, something permanent and something where we, we do build institutions that we feel can, can meet our needs and not just reflect our grievances. Thank you so much for that. And uh, apologies for the technical difficulties. Uh, we'll head next to Costas. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you to all the panelists and everyone who tuned on tonight. Uh, my question is for Professor Peleologos. Uh, the 2022 midterm elections are still seven months away. And with the, our 24 hour news cycle and how quickly the media and information changes, it can be difficult to predict the election this far out. With your background in polling and your current work in different cities, what do you believe is the most important thing for both major parties to rally their base around in order to win a majority in the House and the Senate? And related to that, what do you believe uh, will differ from state to state, uh, if anything at all? Yasu Kostas and Kalopaska, my friend. Um, thank you for the question. So uh, a couple of thoughts about this. Um, First of all, polls are a snapshot in time. Any student of politics needs to understand that as, as sure as we are today and uh, within the confidence level and the bell curve and all of that good stuff, um, things change. Things change between the January presentation I made and you, the Russia invasion in, in February. Um, and so, um, although it may look bleak, President Biden right now and history is working against them and he's got so many things um, that are happening, you know, behind the scenes. He still, and Democrats could still muster a, a, a fight and, and potentially make this interesting. Right now, it's not interesting. Um, if I have to just fast forward from what I'm seeing in the polling today to election day, it's it's going to be a you know a Republican takeover, both Congress and the Senate. Um, now, in, in terms of what specifically could happen, I mean, there are a lot of things that could impact the outcome, um, like the presence of third party candidates. Um, you know, if, you know, I'm not saying Democrats would do this, but if miraculously a number of third party candidates ran for Congress in some of these races that are polling close right now, such that they could break off votes away from the Republican and you'd have a Republican getting some votes and a third party candidate getting some votes might be a libertarian or something else. I think that would help Democrats potentially. I've seen in my experience, both uh, publicly and privately, numerous instances where candidate X from a particular party leading in the polls loses because the candidate Y and Z uh, 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 totals a split. And uh, where, whereas you don't have that in a binary situation. So I think if there were an operation by either party um, in terms of encouraging third party candidates, that could it, that could factor in. We're not talking about third party candidates. I also think, you know, people on the progressive side as always say, you know, the Trump Republican candidates make them nauseous. And I say to them, yes, but you want them to win those primaries. And they look at me with a wrinkled grotesque face as if i'm saying something you know you know but but people need to think three moves ahead on the chessboard not that reflexive one move you want if you're a democrat and progressive democrat you want trump republicans to win those primaries because they are unacceptable as roger pointed out sharon angle linda mcmahon there are numerous instances of this where they are not acceptable to independent voters and Democrats would prevail if uh, you know candidates on the extreme right were nominated. Same problem on the left. If uh, 
too many progressives in a moderate district are uh, nominated, that could pose problems for the Democratic Party as well. Thanks, David. And we'll head next to Wendy Merbell. Thank you so much uh, to the members of the panel for being here tonight. My question is actually for you, Stephanie, and it's three parts, but I promise it's short. <laughs> um, first, I'm interested to know, um, from your perspective as a journalist, what has it been like uh, during a time where some view the facts as fake news and some view fake news as facts? Uh, so what has that kind of been like uh, for your as a journalist? And secondly, I wanted to know, how do you separate your personal views and your feelings um, from reporting on a topic that you feel strongly about? I um, mean, what advice do you have for your colleagues um, in the field of journalism as well who may battle doing the same? Thank you for that question. I'm going to try to get to all three parts. Um, so the first one, you know, how is it reporting in kind of like an information Old world where some people view news as fake that is real news and things like that. I think that as a reporter, what I try to do every day is just read, you know, every single news source that I possibly can and just watch everything that I can. Because, you know, when you're looking at the midterm map and looking at the entire country the way that I do, you know, my beat um, is an umbrella that has all of the House races, all of the Senate races all of the governor's races, redistricting, voting rights, um, you know, all of these different things. Voters are living in different informational universes. If you're somebody who watches MSNBC, you know, chances are you're not flipping the channel and watching Fox. Uh, if you're not watching CNN, same deal. You're probably not switching over to those other channels. Um, and, you know, candidates and politicians know that and they go on different channels where they only talk to kind of their voters, their constituency to plug their websites, to plug their fundraising um, and all of those different things. And so I think that you know, the challenge for me is like what I do as a reporter is, you know, report out the facts the best that I can, um, make sure that everything is true and airtight. You know, we are in an age where you really can't make mistakes. Um, but I think that, you know, the important thing as a reporter to kind of get a view of the entire country and how things are going is to kind of get into those different information spaces where people are living. And, you know, some people don't watch TV at all. Some people are addicted to Twitter. Uh, you know, 80% uh, of the country is not even on Twitter. So uh, it's all about, I think, just kind of like looking in those different places. Um, and then when it comes to kind of my personal feelings versus what I'm reporting on, I think the key is to just comment everything um, being fair. I think, you know, we talk a lot about like in journalism about fairness versus objectivity. And I think fairness is the key, you know, to reach out to every single person that you're reporting on to try to get every perspective, but then not weigh them um, as though they're equal if they're not. Um, an advice that I'd have for my colleagues is, hmm, I haven't, mm, I would say just to read a lot of local news and support local news. That's something that I do every day in my newsletter, looking at different kind of local newspapers all over the country. And it's something that is uh, diminishing and shrinking at a pretty alarming rate and has for the past several decades. Uh, but I think that a lot of the best reporting on these midterm races um, does come from local papers. You know, uh, a reporter who is at the state capitol in Idaho is going to know more about the Idaho governor's race than I do and things like that. So I think like supporting local news, reading it and kind of, you know, uh, elevating it instead of, you know, uh, and just like pointing out those pieces of reporting that are really important, I think is key. There was a great example, a congressman from Hawaii, uh, his local paper pointed out that he hasn't voted in person in Congress in like all of the pandemic. Uh, and that was a great story that you wouldn't really get from a national outlet, but for a congressman's hometown paper, that's like their bread and butter. So, you know, definitely supporting local news. Um, and so thank you th for that question. Um, and I think we have a few more minutes for a few more audience questions. So I'm just going to scroll up. I know we had a good one from RJ. Here it is. Um, and I'll just throw this out to the entire group and you guys can raise your hands or just jump in um, if you'd like to answer. But the question is, uh, when it comes to shaping the narrative for the midterm election, uh, Joe Biden and the DNC recently launched a campaign to use Rick Scott's tax plan is something to run against. And Rick Scott is the chairman of the big Senate Republican committee uh, and, you know, released a plan that kind of, he got some flack from his Republican colleagues about, uh, especially the tax piece. So uh, how do you guys think that this could shape the midterm narrative? Any particular order? Or, um, um, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, it, it's very, very interesting. Um, 
you know, the, the, the Senator from Florida is kind of an odd duck. I, I don't understand why he would go and do interviews and not really know what's in his own proposal. It was extremely low hanging fruit in terms of, um, you know, asking him why they, why he had uh, proposals in there that would just ipso like overtly res- result in, in, in higher taxes on people. And he seemed to, his first response to those attacks were that those were kind of partisan talking points. When in fact, the in one one interview I can think of, the language was directly out of their out of their platform. Um, so I think in that sense, he's 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 making it very easy for people to undermine his credibility in in that regard. We haven't really talked about the former president a little bit, and I'd like to throw that in there because it it, it seems to me. The, and just this, this is just expanding on the Senate point of the question since we started with Senator Scott, that the animosity between the former president and the Senate minority leader is so great that you could make a pretty good case that the former president is going around and is essentially acting as an arsonist to, to Senator McConnell's chances of becoming the majority leader. When you look at what he's doing and who he's supporting from Pennsylvania to Ohio uh it it almost it, it would not be a huge leap to interpret those actions as being vindictive rather than sober kind of socratic political moves and then the last thing to wendy's point if i may um because this is probably my last time talking it's a very interesting thing when one tries to separate their analysis from their opinion right and for me having you know come up uh and 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 worked for just a one or two elected officials you think that you're always going to be producing documents and analysis that are essentially partisan but when you're really if your job is to look at like you know the 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 capacities of the community health centers in massachusetts and the funding that they receive your job is really to just analyze not to you're not there to necessarily um, um, build up and, and, and advance your opinion. So that's something that some of you can look forward to. And some of you are already experiencing for the students in the audience about when you actually go to work for an, an elected official. It very quickly becomes a situation where you're being asked to analyze rather than being asked to constantly share an opinion. And that's one of the first things that gets demystified when you actually start to work for an elected official, I, I think. So sorry to weave a couple things together, but between the Senate and, and the point that Wendy um, asked you about analysis and opinion, um, I wanted to touch on all of those very briefly. Thanks, Roger. Uh, David or Julia, do you guys have thoughts on the uh, Rick Scott's tax plan? Julia? Go for it. Yeah, okay. So I, um, yeah, I think that I, I want to say kind of three things. Um, one is that I think there is a very potent narrative that Democrats are a little cautious about, maybe not without good reason, given that their coalition includes some moderates and given the danger of sort of going too far on economic issues. There is a lot of resentment about economic elites. And I don't know, uh, David, if if you look at open-ended stuff in your survey data, I know some of my quant friends can't believe anyone would look at that, but I've spent about a year with a grad student looking through responses to people's reactions to institutions, and they mention economic elites a lot. Um, I think that that resentment is is really can be um, really a liability for Republicans. And we saw that in 2012 with Mitt Romney being painted with his 47 percent, you know, don't pay taxes comment, um, which is in line, if I recall correctly, with Senator Scott's kind of tax plan. Um, so I think that that's that's one point. Second point is that um that I think that there will be many races that'll be close. And a lot of the Senate races this year are in very competitive states. And so at the margins, a lot of different things, um, a lot of different things can, can matter. My short answer to the question is that the DN triple C needs to poll test. If Senator Scott's plan is persuasive to uh, uh, voters who matter, in terms of um, you know tipping the outcome in a particular congressional district or senate district, they need to run with that. And and students of politics who are watching, whatever you do, whatever campaign you go into, you must poll test your messages. You can't rely on the person that's donated the most money to the candidate, the person who's the childhood friend of the candidate, the family members, or you know uh, particular groups. You have to test in a survey 
a number of messages and then figure out and parse out. That's when your strategic team takes over and says, okay, this is the message we want for 36 to 45 year old women. This is the message we want for old, older white men and so on. And you have a multi-tiered targeted approach, but the messaging is always rooted in the re survey research. It sounds to me like they found an opportunity there. Uh, I don't know if it's applicable nationally or or what the internals are, but um, uh, it sounds like that that might be an opportunity for the Democratic Party. Thanks, David. Um, so we just passed the seven o'clock mark, um, and I want to say thank you to everybody in the audience for sending in your questions. Uh, you know, we got to a few of them, which was really great. And before we wrap up, I have one more question for all three of our panelists. Um, and the question is, what is something that we can watch for as the midterms approach, a data point, you know, a constituency, something that you're looking for um, that we can kind of get a sense of how the midterms are, are shaping up and moving and evolving. For me, it's going to be TV ads. Um, part of my job at Politico, I watch every single political ad that comes through um, on television in every state in the country. And I found that it's a really interesting way to see kind of where candidates messaging is headed. It's one thing to tweet about uh, something or mention it in a stump speech, but I think that you can really see what issues are kind of boiling up and becoming really important that campaigns will then, you know, spend tens of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars to put on TV. A couple of examples of that um, are inflation. And it started as something that popped up in Republican campaign ads and the Democrats like Raphael Warnock and Mark Kelly, their first commercials of the entire midterm cycle were addressing uh, rising costs and inflation. Another thing that I've noticed lately is Republicans actually taking their campaigns to gas stations and like cutting ads with their hand on the gas pump and pointing to the price. So that is definitely, you know, one aspect they're really like looking at closely. The other one is immigration. We've seen candidates from states like uh, South Carolina and Missouri, places that aren't, you know, really anywhere near the Southern border traveling there to go cut ads in front of uh, the unfinished border wall. So those, that's something that I'm watching, kind of what campaigns are really putting their money and effort behind to put up on TV. I think those issues are going to be, I mean, it kind of gives you a sense of what the most important issues are. Um, David, let's go to you first. What are you watching? So I think because inflation has moved so far, so fast in terms of trajectory, I think the successful party is the party that puts inflation at the center of the wheel and creates policy spokes that go in and through the wheel and out of the wheel. And that's that's probably um, the one issue that unfortunately has put climate change and so, voting rights and so many other issues that we normally test, COVID even, by the wayside. Um, now we know that the Fed is gonna raise rates in May. We don't know if it's 50 basis points or 75 and then back again in June. Um, you know, in anticipating those moves, will that create a recessionary uh, spiral such that will that it will be realized in September, October, November? That's something Democrats and Republicans both have to be prepared for, but they need to have a poll tested uh, set of issues and policies that intersect with inflation. Thanks, David. And Roger, we'll go to you next. What's a data point or something that we can watch and kind of track so we can watch the midterms like pros? David's spot on uh, in terms of inflation and just to take kind of like a, a an atmospheric foreign policy uh, issue. I was talking earlier with a TV station in the Middle East about the U.S. reentering the Iran nuclear deal. And if we get back into that and in, say the next month, which I think is possible, Iran's capable of producing up to three million barrels of oil a day. So then it's not too difficult to extrapolate that once that works through the global supply chain, that that could start to influence prices in something as early as like a July. So it, it's just, it's very interesting how as much as we want to think that it's, this is all like kind of a kitchen table family budget kind of issue, there are still these larger kind of international dynamics that can play a role. And then I'll come somewhat full circle. I meant in my first answer, I mentioned Tony Fabrizio's postmortem on 2020. The other thing is, is to what extent the former president is out there um, on the campaign trail in um, August and September and October and things like that, because if he takes on a very vigorous schedule and say, if you buy into my thesis that it's a personal priority for him to make sure that um, Senate Minority Leader McConnell remains so, 
then then we do have some level of rever reverberation of those educated suburban families in some of the districts that I mentioned um, in my first answer outside of Orlando, outside of Philadelphia, outside of um, Cincinnati and Columbus. And, uh, and then, and then you, and then you can have an element of that repudiation kind of dynamic that we've talked about once or twice, because if he comes back out and reminds people what it was like to have uh, that style of um, uh, governance um, during a pandemic uh, et cetera, over the economy and things like that, then all of a sudden you could get that reflective surface back in play that starts to allow President Biden to actually then reposition himself as, as the adult in the room, which was the brand that got him here in the first place. Thanks, Roger. And Julia, we'll give you the last word here. Okay, great. All right. So I have two things. One is very easy to, to measure and, and watch, and one is not as easy. Uh, the first one is, is just the president's approval level. Um, that really to tie back to my opening remarks, that's another distinguishing feature of 2002 and 1998. And, uh, you know, we have to say it doesn't look like that for, for Biden right now. Um, if some of the things that, that Roger's talking about, improvements in, in gas prices and that environment, the economic environment, the COVID environment, if those things change, then it's possible we could see that, that shift. Um, I don't know. But that's the first thing I would look at. The second thing I would look at is, is grassroots mobilization. And I think that's a key feature of some of the recent midterms we've been alluding to, uh, to 2010 with the Tea Party movement and to uh, 2018 and the kind of anti-Trump resistance. And I think that is really going to tell us something about what we might expect to see in terms of turnout. Um, and that's really been a, a huge shift in the last two elections, 2018 and 2020, is the kinds of turnout that we've seen. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Um, and, you know, before we wrap up tonight, I'd just like to say a few thank yous. Thank you to our panelists for doing such a fantastic job. Thank you to the student questioners and our questioners in the audience. And again, thanks to Suffolk University, uh, the Ford Hall Forum, the Washington Center, and GBH. Uh, it was my pleasure to host as your moderator tonight. And before we wrap up, I will send it back to Christina. Thank you, Stephanie. What a great conversation. And I could go on for at least another hour. Like I've got my own questions. Turnout at primaries, isn't that more important than turnout at midterms? But maybe you can all come back for another, another round of this. So typically at the end of these, I thank everyone who has been on the panel and I thank the audience and I thank the students. But since this is the wrap up episode of our series, I'd like to extend that thank you to everyone who has participated. So to give you an idea of what we've managed to do and the reach that we've had, here are a couple of slides that lay out the number of participants up to and including you guys, but here are some stats. We have had 25 Suffolk students participate live, 26 guest panelists, six faculty and staff from Suffolk have been actively working on this and forget about advancement and everything else. Um, we've answered more than 19 audience questions. Um, of course, we've mentioned this before, it's 202 days until the midterm. There have been 15 plus organizations that have been represented on the panel. And we have had 25 students on camera. So this is a really great civic engagement project that we're working on here. And it is really public pedagogy, right? And I hope you all panelists and audience members have enjoyed a long form civil conversation that goes in depth. So I also want to thank our student interns who have tirelessly worked behind the scenes to do all kinds of things from tweeting out 
live every episode and adding to the chat after frantically Googling everything that you guys have said. And they are Olivia, Grace, Holly, and Kyla. So thank you all. And th that's a wrap. Have dinner and look out for another invitation from us for the next round. Thank you so much. <laughs>